She taught at Michigan State University before moving to San Diego, where she holds the Jerry and Jeannie Wranglis Endowed Chair in Ancient Greek History. She is the author of Negotiating Identity in the Ancient Mediterranean and her most recent book, Phoenicians Among Others, My, Why Migrants Mattered in the Ancient Mediterranean. Uh, which will be published later this year by Oxford Press. Welcome to Professor Dimitriou. Thank you very much for inviting me to present my work to you today. Let me just take a moment to share my screen. And we see it and hear you just fine. Excellent, thank you for confirming that. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I, uh, today I'm going to share with you what I've been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, and that research, as Susan mentioned, um, is going to be published by Oxford uh, this year at some point. Uh, the book is uh, titled Phoenicians Among Others, Why Migrants Mattered in the Ancient Mediterranean. And the Phoenicians were a Near Eastern Semitic speaking population. They were famous for their seafaring and their craftsmanship and um, their trading ventures. They were organized in um, powerful and independent and very wealthy uh, city states, uh, such as the ones that you see on this map. Um, and some of the ones that we'll be uh, referring to in the talk are uh, Kition right here on Cyprus, Byblos, Sidon, um, Tyre. The city-states that will appear in this talk, like Byblos here, Sidon, Tyre, Kition on the, on the um, island of Cyprus. And uh, the other thing that's important to know about the Phoenicians is that by the 8th century BCE, they had founded settlements throughout the ancient Mediterranean. And on this slide, all of the sort of darker areas here, basically uh, along the, the coast of the Near East that we were just looking at, North Africa, um, and even the southern coasts of Spain, Sicily, Sicily, Corsica, Sardinia, Malta, are areas where the Phoenicians established settlements. So essentially, there were the other major Mediterranean group besides the Greeks, um, and later the Romans. Uh, migrants in the ancient Mediterranean is a demographic or make up, I guess, a demographic that hasn't been uh, studied very much at all. In fact, very few people have paid attention to migrants. But the reality is that they actually made up a very large percentage of, the, of any uh, city state's uh, population. If we take the example of Athens, for instance, like the most famous city, I would say, from the Greek world, uh, we know that there were about, or we estimate that there were about um, between 16 to 20% of the free male population in Athens were foreign born. And this figure underreports the actual number because it includes only those immigrants who registered in the city as they were supposed to. And it actually completely ignores the enslaved population living in Athens, um, all of whom had been born elsewhere and therefore were migrants. And by contrast, I guess, just to make the statistics a little bit more meaningful for us today, uh, in 2015 in the US, the documented permanent, documented permanent residents were 4% of the population and the percentage of both documented and undocumented foreign born residents in 2019 uh, was 13.17%. These are the most, these numbers are based on the most recent, uh, recent um, census figures. So the foreign population of Athens was actually quite large and it was even larger um, as time went on. But uh, still, the reality is that very few studies of Athens pay attention to this important demographic. And when they do pay attention to it, they focus primarily on um, texts that are produced by Athens about immigrants rather than um, paying attention to what the immigrants themselves say. 
And so on the one hand, these uh, works have revealed to us the exclusionary politics of Athens, but they haven't told us very much about the experiences of the migrants themselves. And that's basically what I'm interested in. I'm interested in recovering the voices of the immigrants themselves. What can they tell us about their experiences? How did their identities change? What was their relationship with their host state? Uh, how did their presence change their host state? And the central question that motivates um, my research and that also sort of motivates this talk is behind this talk is what were the effects of mobility and migration, specifically in the fourth century BCE? Did migrant matters? And because I presume and think that they do, then my question is how? So what I would like to do is just share three brief examples of Phoenician immigrants uh, living in Athens to think about how migrants uh, adapted in their new homes and how they also transformed their new homes. And my first example will be um, the example of uh, the story of Zeno, uh, the founder of the philosophical school of Stoicism which is widely recognized today as one of the major contributions of the ancient Greeks. And here you see a statue of, of Zeno. Uh, but in fact, Zeno was not a Greek. Zeno was a Phoenician. Uh, he was a Phoenician immigrant in Athens and originally from Kidion, uh, which was a mixed Phoenician and Greek city-state on Cyprus, as I pointed out earlier. And this statue that you see here is actually a modern one placed in that city today. Uh, his arrival in Athens uh, sometime in the fourth century BCE is, um, how can I describe it? Uh, it was inauspicious, let's say, um, because he was actually shipwrecked off the coast of Athens on his way to the port of Athens, Piraeus, uh, he was on a Phoenician ship that was carrying uh, the quintessential Phoenician pro a product of purple dye. And what the first thing that Zeno did was, naturally, after he uh, was shipwrecked, uh, the first thing that he did was visit a bookstore. And um, he picked up a book by uh, or about the philosopher Socrates, which was written by one of uh, Socrates' students. He read it and then he decided that uh, he wanted to find a teacher like Socrates and he told the bookseller this and the bookseller um, just looked outside and saw another philosopher passing by and pointed him to Zeno and said, here he is, you know, your, your future um, teacher. And in fact, Zeno did study under this man whose name was Crates. And subsequently, Zeno established his own school in the very heart of Athens, um, in a store, in a public marketplace. And it was open and free to anyone um, to attend. And Stoicism, we know, flourished among the Romans, uh, winning over even emperors like Marcus Aurelius. And it continues to enjoy a lot of popularity even today when it has become um, actually quite popular among the business community. But were it not for mobility and migration, Stoicism may not have developed into one of the most influential schools of antiquity. And immigrants like Zeno were often upwardly socially mobile, but they also faced prejudice and discrimination. Ancient sources, for instance, describe Zeno's Phoenician ethnicity and his foreignness as undesirable traits. Even his teacher called him little Phoenician, which was a you know, somewhat demeaning term of endearment. And a person who wrote uh, Zeno's biography, uh, Diogenes Laertius, described him as, a st as stingy because he was a foreigner. And he was even accused of plagiarism by another rival Greek philosopher who claimed that Zeno would walk into his school, listen to his ideas, and then dress them in Phoenician, uh, steal them, plagiarize them, and dress them in Phoenician style. 
And even after his death, one of Zeno's students composed an epigram in his, um, in his honor, in which he um, tries to downplay Zeno's Phoenician origins. And this is the, 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 the epigram ends with the lines that you actually see on this, hopefully see on the slide um, right now. And it ended with, what reproach is there if your fatherland is Phoenicia? Did not Cadmus also come from there, from whom Hellas, that's uh, what the Greeks called Greece, uh, has writing? So his foreign origins from what was a predominantly Phoenician city-state were a handicap for Zeno in some ways. And for me, he serves as a compelling example of what I argue in um, this book, namely that immigrants had a sense of otherness imposed on them by their host communities, but also that even in the face of um, discrimination, they profoundly shaped the societies in which they lived. But it's still difficult to discern what it was like to be an immigrant um, in, in Athens or anywhere, anywhere else in the ancient Mediterranean, because we usually study sources that were produced by the state, the host state, or by members of um, that host state, as I also mentioned earlier. So when I was working on this book, I discovered that there was an untapped body of sources that was uh, produced by Phoenician immigrants that could actually show me what these immigrants uh, said. These sources are epigraphic, uh, so they are texts that are inscribed on stone. And I show you some of them, some of them on this slide, just so that you can get a sense of the variety of the things that I, um, or what these things look at that I, um, that I study. Um, and so I've spent quite some time looking over these written evidence that Finnish and immigrants left behind. And what you're looking at on this slide and just in general um, are mostly bilingual texts in Greek and in Phoenician that uh, were inscribed on uh, private tombstones, for example, administrative documents and dedications in religious sanctuaries. And scholars used to treat these texts as curiosities as um, they were only ever studied by uh, linguists or philologists, but to me, they reveal the social world of immigrants. So to study these bilingual texts, I actually spent uh, summer learning biblical Hebrew so that I could um, be able to read what these stones said because it's a, a language that's very close to Venetian. And then when I arrived at UCSD, I, uh, my colleague, my then colleague who is now among your ranks, um, uh, Bill Prop, actually would sit with me every week and we would read biblical Hebrew and we would translate. And then we would also just sort of look at the Phoenician texts. And so he helped me make the transition between uh, or from Biblical Hebrew to uh, Phoenician. And when I read these texts in Phoenician, I realized that these migrants faced issues that continue to challenge migrants and states um, today, how to adapt and uh, feel a sense of belonging, um, how to construct a new identity, uh, how to promote or manage migration from the perspective of a, either um, the home state of, of migrants or the host state. And just as immigrants today, the Phoenicians that I study developed a variety of strategies to adapt to migration. And this statement sort of brings me to my second example. Uh, one of the most common adaptive practices among Phoenician immigrants was that of name changing, which of course has, is, is a familiar practice among, among immigrants. And we can think about all the stories of immigrants arriving at Ellis Island and either declaring English, English sounding names or being given um, English sounding names by the officials there. Many Phoenician immigrants in ancient Greek communities seem to have done the same and they voluntarily changed their names in one of three ways. They either translated their Phoenician name into a Greek one, uh, they 
adopted a Greek name that was completely unrelated to their Phoenician name, or they modified their Phoenician name by Hellenizing it, so to speak, in spelling and in grammar. And I'd like to illustrate these practices using um, the example that you see on the slide here, uh, which is a fourth century BCE tombstone from Athens of a man named Antipatros. When Antipatros died, his burial plot was marked with a tombstone shaped like the facade of a Greek temple. You can see here on the left of the slide is the complete tombstone, and you can see what I mean by the facade of a temple here at the top. Um, and um, um, below this, this uh, little pediment, this triangular thing on top of the slide, we have uh, a funerary epitaph. Beneath that, which is inscribed right here, beneath that is an image, and underneath that is a longer text. So I'll come to these, uh, all these three elements. Um, I'll, I'll refer to them in this, in this section of the talk. The epitaph is written twice, once in Greek and once in Phoenician. And when we compare the Greek and the Phoenician text, we can see um, that some Phoenicians, uh, some Phoenician immigrants Hellenized their name. So the commissioner, for example, this man, Dom Selech, this is how he identifies his name in Phoenician, uh, gave his name in Greek, uh, a Greek ending. So he became Dom Salos. Others chose uh, unrelated Greek names. So the deceased, Shem, did this and became Antipatros in Greek. And some of them translated their names. So Antipatros identifies himself as the son of Aphrodisios. And Aphrodisios is a very good translation of the Phoenician name of his father, which is um, Abdashtard. Abdashtard means um, Abdashtard means uh, servant of Astarte, who was a Phoenician goddess, and she was considered to be the equivalent or the analog of the Greek Aphrodite. So Aphrodisios is a good translation. The translation, this particular translation of Phoenician gods into their Greek equivalents also indicates to us that the Greeks and the Phoenicians who were in contact with each other because of mobility and migration had become intimate, intimately familiar with each other's divinities. And so by changing their names, Phoenician immigrants voluntarily changed the way that they identified themselves, perhaps to fit in. Uh, so we can ask, you know, was name changing a, a, a voluntary behavior as I have been describing it? Um, it's doubtful that Phoenician speakers in Athens or, or really elsewhere in the Greek world would have passed for uh, Greeks as um, mainly because of their Greek language skills as the example of Zeno also demonstrated to us, right? Quite the opposite in fact, because he was subjected to disparaging comments because he was a foreigner. But name changing might have boosted their status and established them or established some basis of trust that facilitated their presence and their work in a Greek speaking city and perhaps also encouraged a sense of belonging. Uh, but what's interesting is also that this practice didn't ever erase Phoenicians civic or linguistic identities. They always provided their state of origin. So Antipatros tells us that he was from Ashkelon and Dom Selech, the person who commissioned this tombstone tells us that he was from Sidon. And of course they use the Phoenician alphabet and language on these tombstones. And that shows us that by changing their names, Phoenician immigrants were not trying to hide their foreign origin. Now, besides changing names, um, Phoenician immigrants in Athens and elsewhere also changed habits and even created new customs and modes of identification. Migrants faced some very practical pro problems. For example, foreigners did not have the right to own land unless it had been granted to them by the state. 
So uh, this, for instance, meant that they could not be buried in public uh, cemeteries because they or, or or the cemeteries of Athens because they could not because they could not own land. Um, so they had to find ways around this. Um, and we have some examples of Phoenician immigrants from the city state of Sidon who reused tombstones and reused burial plots. So perhaps one individual from among that community achieved the rare privilege of the right to own property and other members of his community benefited from this because they were able to use the same plot. Another problem that they faced was how to maintain the traditions, the funerary traditions or religious traditions effectively of their homeland uh, when they were living in a, in a foreign land. The tombstones of Phoenician immigrants in Athens suggest that the wider immigrant community came together to solve um, these um, problems. Even recording the name of the person who had commissioned a tombstone, as we have um, in this example here that you see on the slide, indicates the importance of the wider community in performing burial rites for their fellow immigrants. For example, right, Antipatros's tombstone was set up by Don Sele, who was from a completely different city state and unrelated. Um, and we have several examples of this, and I'll just show you one more. This is um, another bilingual epitaph of a Sidonian woman. The Greek text provides only her transliterated name, the name of her father, which is Hellenized, and then her place of origin. But the Phoenician text actually includes details that are not mentioned in the Greek text, and these details are about the person who commissioned this um, tombstone for her. This man um, who identifies himself as Yaton Baal, the son of Eshmun Saloth, uh, was also the great priest of the god Mergal. So now we also perhaps have the presence of Phoenician divinities in Athens too. We will talk more about that uh, shortly. But these texts illustrate that the wider Sidonian community played an integral role in performing the appropriate burial rites and in um, erecting commemorative grave monuments for members of that immigrant community. And it may even be the case that Phoenician individuals traveled from Phoenician states to provide the appropriate burial rites to immigrants who died abroad. And I'm going to bring us back to the tombstone of Antipatros because it alludes to this. Underneath the epitaph that I showed you earlier is this image. You can see a close up here on the right of the slide. And then we have an epigram, a little poem that um, refers to the image and refers to the uh, events that were associated with death and burial. The form of the text is Greek but the content, like what it refers to, does not really seem to be Greek or doesn't make sense in the Greek context. In addition, the spelling here is off or peculiar, let's say. The phrasing is um, obscure and the grammar is really awkward. So this is actually typical of bicultural products uh, when people who speak um, different languages sort of try to express the ideas that are you know, coming from one culture into the language of, of another. So it was probably composed by someone for whom Greek was a second language and he was trying to convey these ideas and customs that were Phoenician. And when we look at the, the, this little poem, it seems that there is a concern here that the body receive a proper burial. And we can see this in the last line that refers to a buried body and the celebration of the friends who came to Athens to build him a tomb on this sacred ship, as the, as the epigram says. So it's possible that these men and the sacred ship had the official function of ferrying across the, the sea Phoenicians who would be able to perform the customary burial rites for immigrants living abroad. 
And this practice of combining Greek and Phoenician elements into in the poem is also visible in the image itself. So the image um, depicts the, um, the corpse here lying on a bed. Um, we can see the prow of a ship sort of emerging from behind there. We have a lion that sort of menacingly hovering over the, the dead body. And then a man on this side who is like reaching across as though to protect this body. So some of the elements in this relief um, are commonly found in Athenian funerary art, like the lion or the ship but others are extremely unusual, like the dead body. The Athenians do not depict um, dead bodies on their tombstones. So we have the, a, a combination of both familiar and unfamiliar elements that resulted in what was an astounding image that would not have been comprehensive to a Greek. And maybe it wouldn't have been completely understood by a Phoenician either, giving the Greek form of the monument. Right, just as in the case of the Greek um, epigram, because the form there is Greek, but it's not written in, it, in idiomatic Greek. And even though the poem begins with this line, let no one wonder at this image. So it's basically trying to explain what this image represents without the correct cultural references, it remains mysterious. And so it's mysterious to scholars, but it was probably also mysterious to the ancient people looking at this. So Phoenician immigrants in Athens were um, comfortable operating in this space that existed between two worlds. And their cultural references might not make sense to the Greeks, but they still gesture at inclusion in Athenian um, society. Now, um, for the third example that I, um, that I want to talk about today is um, in, the, in the final one, uh, what I would like to do is turn to the organization of Phoenician speaking immigrants in Athens into communities, into professional um, trade associations. These were, these associations were innovative. They were introduced in Greek communities by Phoenicians, by Phoenician migrants in the fourth century BCE. And they were sort of quasi state associations that had the authority and the political power to petition the host state on behalf of their members. So even though migrants didn't have a direct political say, right, and this is another practical problem that they have to solve, they were able to influence state policies by coming together and forming these associations. But these associations also organized foreigners into communities that were centered around the worship of a deity that was important in their city state of origin. So um, in a sense, then these professional associations facilitated the presence of, uh, or facilitated being an immigrant. And it also introduced the worship of foreign divinities in Athens, as we will see. Um, and, um, I, I want to give two examples of this practice. Um, the first one is, the, is a professional association by the Kitians, again, the people of Kition on Cyprus, who formed a trade association to represent their, the interest of the Kitian traders, but also of the Kitian community living in Athens more broadly. So what you see on the slide right now is a steely, um, that dates to the fourth century BCE. And it records that a group of Phoenician traders from Kidion on Cyprus approached the Athenian state with a request. And their request was the right for the right to own land so that they could establish a sanctuary of Aphrodite on it. Now, remember that immigrants were not allowed to own land. That right could only be granted to them by the state. This meant as we mentioned earlier, that they couldn't be buried in, in cemeteries, but they also couldn't build their own homes on land that they owned. They couldn't build their own sanctuaries. So if they wanted to do any of these things, they had to um, either carry out some benefaction for the state, uh, which would then honor them for, for that benefaction with the privilege of owning land, or they could come together as an association 
and use their collective bargaining power to petition the state for this right. And this is what we see happening in this case. Um, the Athenian state thought that the Kidian request was legitimate and um, they granted them this right and the Kidian traders built their temple. And they also inscribed that decision of the Athenian uh, state on stone. And, they, and this is what you see on the slide. And they set it up in that, in that temple. In this way, the Kidians publicized also to the Kidian immigrant community right, and anyone else passing by their sanctuary, both the, leg the legitimacy of the group's request, but also the service of this association to its members. Um, now, let me just for a moment comment on Aphrodite here, because Aphrodite, this is, they want the land so that they can build a temple dedicated to Aphrodite. And Aphrodite and her Phoenician equivalent Astarte were both very prominent divinities in Kidion. So the Kidion's choice to build a temple to a deity that was prominent in their home state indicates their wish to perform the traditional religious um, uh, practices and also to retain uh, that part of their um, identity, including their civic identity as Kidians. So overall then this um, Kidian trade association served as a hub for the Kidian immigrant community. It represented the interests of its members and the broader community of, of Kidian immigrants in Athens. Um, and what's interesting is, to me is that the, these uh, professional associations were essentially incorporated into the Athenian um, political apparatus, giving immigrants the power to petition the host state and so participate in a way in its deliberative processes and influence its decisions. But the Kidians were not the only ones who did this. The Sidonians who were living in Athens also formed a trade association and were able to maintain their religious traditions by working around these restrictions that came with the status of, of being an immigrant. Uh, the uh, stele on the slide is a bilingual inscription this time, um, also fourth century which mentions an association of Sidonians that honored one of their members. Um, this uh, man performed, had benefited the association by outfitting the sanctuary and so, sort of sponsoring and um, financing essentially a lot of the renovations that had taken place. Uh, and uh, he also performed various other tasks that were entrusted upon him by the association. So, um, the Sidonian Association got together and as an assembly made the decision to honor this man. But they also decided to announce this decision by inscribing this stone and setting it up at the temple of Baal, a Phoenician god. And they honored this man during a religious festival, um, a, relig a, a Phoenician ritual feast, the um, uh, which apparently was also practiced then in Athens. So the celebration of this religious festival maintained the traditions of Sidon, just as building a sanctuary to Aphrodite, um, what, uh, basically doing that, building a sanctuary of Aphrodite did the same thing for the Kidians. But we also should think that the worship of Phoenician divinities in Athens like Baal or Astarte or, um, Nergal, whom we saw mentioned earlier on a tombstone, I mean, all this demonstrates that the presence of um, immigrant communities also changed their host states, right? It introduced foreign gods and um, different traditions to Greek communities. And so I think in a way the text reflects the social changes that were happening. The religious landscape of the city was changing because of the presence of immigrants. So just to finish this up, I'd like to just sort of share a few thoughts about what I think this, these examples show to us. Um, first, I think they show that the strategies that Phoenician immigrants adopted, like name changing, for example, facilitated their lives in their host societies and encouraged the sense of belonging. It also enabled them to maintain links to their uh, home states. Um, especially through the trade associations, for example. 
Second, I think they challenged both their home and their host states, uh, which responded in creative ways to um, deal with migration. And ultimately, I think the relationship between immigrants and their home and host states um, eventually broadened what it meant to be a resident and even a citizen of a state. But beyond these changes, the presence of immigrants changed the immigrants themselves, and it also changed the societies in which they lived in. Right? Over time, I think products like the uh, stones that we have been um, looking at, which are products of migration, like the tombstones or religious dedications in foreign alphabets, uh, in a city's uh, cemeteries or in its sanctuaries, or even the establishment of temples dedicated to foreign divinities, or you know, names that uh, sounded Greek but were actually Phoenician, uh, all of this became part of the social fabric of Greek society. And so migrants changed how cities looked and even their daily sounds. Ultimately, I think case studies like uh, this one of Phoenician immigrants in Athens who lived between two worlds show how migration transformed multi-ethnic societies into cosmopolitan ones because it resulted in polities whose civic bodies were made up of a diverse population with different religions, different languages, and different institutions. But immigrants and citizens are alike were integral um, members who contributed to and maintained and belonged to the societies in which um, they lived. So Greek societies were profoundly altered by the contributions of Phoenician immigrants, right? Intellectuals like Zeno produced new ideas, traders created new institutions that were incorporated into the Greek state's political economy, and immigrants collectively helped form these multi-ethnic and diverse societies that thrived throughout the ancient Mediterranean. So while traditionally we have idealized ancient Greek thought and politics and society, I hope that my research shows that it is unlikely that they would have taken the form they did without the contributions of migrants. So I'll stop here and I'm happy to take questions if anyone has uh, questions and I'll stop sharing my screen um, for now, but if we need to go back to it, I'm happy to go back to it. Thank you so much, Denise Dimitri. This was really a fabulous talk. Um, it struck me all the way through as you were speaking, the similarities with so many of the issues and tensions that we deal with today with migration and you know name changing and assimilation and you know impact. And I, I just wonder. Did you ever find or concrete evidence of the Athenians actually recognizing and valuing the the impact of immigrants? Yeah, we have. Um, yes, I guess. Uh, thank you for for that. And it's true. One of the things that I say in the acknowledgement, sort of in the beginning of the book, is like. You know, of course, I'm writing this book in the last, you know, two, three years. Um, and there's, and of course, I'm also an immigrant myself. So I think, you know, I have like <laughs> all of these things just sort of come together. You know, my experiences, you know, becoming a citizen and uh, at a time when xenophobia was sort of more prevalent in the US and, and also, um, yeah, just thinking about how, how I deal with the subjects, how other people deal with the subjects, and just the combination of sort of having whatever one experiences individually with whatever the states that we are living in, you know, are doing. Um, so thank you for that comment. Um, uh, now, yes, um, there are texts in Athens that either appreciate individual immigrants or um, make the case in political treatises that migrants should be treated, um, uh, uh, <laughs> should be treated well so that they can benefit the state. Uh, so benefit Athens, for instance. 
So I'll just give you two examples of one of each, just so that we like ha have a sense of what these things look like. So for instance, we have the crease of the state that are again inscribed on stone and published that say, oh, we, we'd like to honor this person who is from Sidon. He's a trader. He actually sold grain to Athens at a lower price than the market price at the time of famine um, or, or grain shortages, basically, uh, which occurred periodically, mostly because of environmental reasons. Um, and for this service that he made for us, we are going to give him not only the right to own property, but also the right to sail in and out of Athens without paying taxes or without having to pay um, immigrants had to pay, who registered as immigrants had to pay an immigrant tax. So they would give them exemptions from having to pay that tax. Um, it, it, they would basically give them all sorts of different honors and privileges, including sometimes even the honor of, of citizenship, making them citizens. Mm -hmm. So those are, that's just, and we have uh, many of these examples of the state honoring individual people. And sometimes we also know that um, these professional trade associations were petitioning the state to, for these types of awards for individuals. But we also have these political treaties also from the fourth century BC that basically says in order to, and again, you know, this is from the Athenian perspective, so it's going to benefit Athens as well, but it says in order for Athens to have the revenues that it needs, we need to pay more attention to migrants and we need to encourage migrants to come to Athens and we have to encourage them to be able to live in Athens. Um, and so it kind of outlines different things like giving them the right to own property or expediting court cases or uh, sort of details what kind of access they would have to courts in order to sort of move through that process more quickly other kinds of awards that they should give them so that they will sort of bring these people into the fold um, who would then be able to benefit Athens' um, economy and increase its um, sources of revenue, or increase and, its revenues. And on the flip side, did you find uh, proof of sort of what we've experienced here in the States and in many other countries, they've experienced it as well, the sort of anti-immigrant sentiment? Did you yeah. also see? Yeah, so there's lots because uh, just a few years before these treaties that I was just describing, another person publishes another political treaties that says, um, oh, you know, it's, it's become so difficult for us, Athenians to distinguish between Athenians and immigrants and slaves because they all look alike and they all dress alike and we should find ways to, and this shouldn't be the case. So whenever you get, so you often get instances where um, people are compl complaining about the blaring of identities and, um, and, and wanting to distinguish like who is the real Athenian um, versus, you know, who is an immigrant or who is an enslaved person. So, um, yeah, most definitely. And we also have other texts that are not as directly, uh, I mean, they, they still make explicit statements about this, but they are not, you know, a political position like this one is. So even in Greek tragedies, for example, Athenian tragedies, uh, there are a couple of them that talk about how difficult it is to be a migrant in Athens, because if you're a migrant in Athens, if, and you become prominent, then you sort of elicit the jealousy and envy of the Athenians. Um, but if you are quiet, then you really have nothing because you don't have the status that you need to be uh, liked and be incorporated in that community. So you, you again have, you know, so yes, we have texts from both sides. Very interesting. Christine Hunfeld, your question? Yes, yeah, thank you, Denise. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, well, a little bit in the same direction as Suzanne's question, I think that a lot of the migrant experience depends on the porosity of the receiving state, you know, and how you deal with it. But on the other hand, what I'm also seeing in your presentation in your book, which I, which I know, uh, is the competition that arises. Because if you're talking about merchants, I mean, Athens is very well known for its very strong merchant class as well. 
So what explains the uh, kind of mobility that the Canadians have in terms of uh, the interests of a certain group within Athenian society? No, they, I mean, it may be a uh, maybe even better explained if we look into what Phoenicians actually did and uh, how well they knew the markets better than the Athenians, no? So there is also a territorial link. And the other question I had is about, I mean, where did these uh, Phoenicians live? I mean, they didn't have the territory, no? They didn't have the land. And so what did they do? And territoriality is also a very important uh, item in terms of uh, identity, no? and in terms of mimetizing with the ambiente you arrive at. So uh, what were the vindications in terms of land ownership and territoriality no? uh, yeah. for the group of migrants, especially if they were organized or were they just merchants on constant mobility and they didn't need any territory? So yeah. they, Basically, my on the top of my head, some stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Christine. It's nice to see you here. Um, um, yeah, so maybe I should start from the second one. Um, so we think that even though they uh, immigrants couldn't own land, that they could rent houses. Um, so they definitely lived in Athens. And a lot of them probably lived in Piraeus, which is the port of Athens, because when we look at um, funerary inscriptions from Piraeus and compare them from other uh, um, administrative units in Athens, Piraeus has a larger percentage of immigrants, uh, of, of funerary, of inscriptions that, of, I'm sorry, of tombstones that indicate that they belonged to immigrants. So the, they were probably at the port of Piraeus. And, you know, to the extent that um, all of these people were traders. They were probably not all traders. Obviously, some people are scribes. They're inscribing the stones. Some people identify themselves as priests. So there are other professions here as well, but, um, but they were famous for their trading ventures. And most of the stuff that we see about them from Athens it does refer to their trading activities. So even though they couldn't own land, they could definitely live in, um, in Athens you know, through renting houses. Uh, and the fact that they are all concentrated in Piraeus, and of course, it's not just the Phoenicians who are here, we also have other foreigners from other places uh, who are living in Piraeus, does sort of designate that part of Athens as being different. And in fact, you know, ancient texts call it a world apart, even though it's part of the city state of Athens, they call it a world apart because they see it as being a, a more democratic than the city of Athens, because it's populated by people who are the hoi polloi, right? The demos who actually has control of the government in Athens. Um, and, uh, but also, yeah, the, the hoi polloi in the sense of um, middle and lower classes. Um, it's also the place where Athens has its fleet, its naval fleet. Um, and the people who man that fleet are Athenian men who belong to the lower uh, economic classes because um, the Athenian census actually calculated people's, was based on people's um, residence, but it also calculated their uh, property. It was a property assessment as well at the same time. So we know that the people manning, the crews manning the, the ships were actually the poorer Athenians. So, there's this distinction, you know, from the, the elite Athenians definitely see Piraeus as being a different area. So it's not, I don't think it's quite the territoriality that you're referring to, but I want to point this out because it does kind of, there is a geographic distinction here um, as well. Um, and the first question, yeah, the Athenians are also benefiting because the Phoenicians have the largest trade networks in terms of the geographic extent because it really reaches into Mesopotamia right, and, and the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and it goes all the way to Spain. So, uh, you know, there was a, an exhibition at the Met, um, gosh, I can't remember, 2015 maybe, I think it was in 2014, 2015, um, that was called From Assyria to Iberia and it showcased Phoenicians, right? Because essentially they, they are the connectors. 
they're the people who actually connect these whole regions. So they definitely had this very large extent, extensive trading network that no other Mediterranean people had. You know, the Greeks didn't have such a, such a large um, trade network and they definitely were tapping into that network by honoring Phoenicians in the way that they did. Wonderful. Questions from other members? If not, I would have a follow-up question, if I may, Susan. Please, go ahead. I was wondering about the relationship between immigrants, particularly in the city where they congregated, no? Is there yeah. any connections? I mean, this is one of the points we are discussing a lot here in the United States, no? And yeah. the divisions, no, within the immigrating, immigrating communities. Yeah, I was going to bring in an example, and then I ended up just deleting it at the end because I thought it was too much of intermarriage, for example. Um, so we have, uh, just to stick to Phoenicians, but obviously this is, this is just one example of many. Um, we have an example of a, um, here, I, I can show you this even. Um, let me go back here, see if I can, oops. Okay, um, you can see this tombstone. So this is a tombstone of, a Greek woman, but she's from the city state of Byzantium. So she's an immigrant in Athens. Um, Byzantium becomes Constantinople and now Istanbul. And it's a bilingual, the text of the epitaph is bilingual um, in Greek and in Phoenician. So here the idea is probably that her husband was Phoenician. Um, and so she belongs in both worlds again. You know, she's an immigrant, he's an immigrant. They are they are um, married and they um, both uh, live in Athens, but they are part of the immigrant community. So we have these kinds of, um, this is probably the most obvious way of seeing um, what the relations are among immigrants, immigrants who come from different places in Athens. Uh, we also see it sometimes in trade because some of the court speeches that we have. So these are, these are um, forensic speeches delivered in the courtrooms in Athens, cases brought against you know, people or for people. And um, we have some examples where people are, are claiming, you know, for instance, oh, you didn't actually, uh, I gave you, I lent you money for this trading expedition and you lost the, your ship sunk. So now I want, you know, to recuperate my loan or, you know, what, whatever it may be. But they describe who the ship owner is, um, who the traders are, sometimes who the crew of the ship is, and they are from all over. Like they're, they're totally, you know, different places in the Greek world, Phoenicians. So it's very mixed. You have very mixed crews. Um, but what we don't see is associations that kind of um, are composed of different groups. They really seem, the ones that we have seem to be structured around one specific city state. Do you see any cases of um, immigrants um, gathering and say rising up uh, and clamoring for better rights or uh, better treatment? Yeah, no, um, no examples of that. Um, no examples of that. I can't think of any, of any. I mean, we, we it's definitely, I mean, some of them, you know, part of the, part, I think part of the reason why we don't see that is that the evidence that we have that survives is skewed towards the elites, yeah. you know, either way, right? So even if like somebody who is honored, you know, for selling grain at lower prices or just gifting grain or just gifting money to Athens, 50 talents or whatever it may be, it's a, it's a huge amount. We're really talking about, you know, the 2% of the, of the 1% the or 2% of the population here. So this, it was much easier for them um, than it was for other members of the community. And I guess, you know, part of what we see is that they create these structures that benefit the whole of the immigrant community, but we don't really hear very much about those members of the community who are experiencing um, 
uh, yeah, um, prejudice and discrimination. Like when we hear about prejudice and discrimination, it's actually coming from the Athenian sources who are mm -hmm. imagining these immigrants, you know, expressing those opinions. So it's not a historical event. We can't see, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the historical record, something that would indicate that that would take place. But there's one large exception here um, to what I've just said, and that's uh, enslaved populations, because they do rebel, but they rebel because they are slaves, not because they are migrants, even though they are both. But at least when we look at the sources, when they describe, you know, what they, what they are, um, what they want or why they are rebelling, they, they want fr their freedom, their freedom of their person. And once a slave is uh, freed, they automatically acquire the status of an immigrant. Mm. Mm. All right, well, this was an absolutely fabulous talk. <laughs> really, really interesting. I mean, it, I think it has bearing in so many ways on you know the issues that we deal with day to day today. And I thank you so much for this uh, wonderful peek inside uh, antiquity and another aspect of it. So thank you very, very much for your time and expertise. No, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to do this. It's always a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.